uh, in the Scripture. Uh, and it's the blood of Jesus Christ. And it, uh, I'll, I'll blame this on John Bradley Tell him I'll blame it, blame it on John Bradley Steelman. Uh, he asked me a question after I preached maybe on Easter. I'm not sure. He came up to me and asked me a question. And because of my uh, probing and study uh, from his question, I got back in the book of Hebrews. And uh, so we'll blame this on him. But I, uh, I got back to the end of the ninth chapter of Hebrews. And I got down to verse 22 and it says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And then it says this amazing statement. It says, without shedding of blood is no remission. Without shedding of blood is no remission. And your newer versions will say something like there's no forgiveness. Well, how many of you believe that you need forgiveness? Well, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. And obviously we all need forgiveness. In 1 John 1.7 it says, The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. It's one of the great statements in our, in our Bibles. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Say all sin. All cleanses sin. us. Cleanses us from all sin. I know the world doesn't act like it, but there's a seriousness to sin. I know we we, we try to trivialize it and make it not not so big a deal. But sin is a big deal and it couldn't be more serious. Sin alienates us from God. It alienates us from God's presence. Sin separates us from God. That's what the preachers told me when I was a little boy. I remember hearing it, that sin separates you from God. That's what sin does. There's a remedy. And there's only one. And it's the blood of Jesus Christ. And He gave a once and for all sacrifice that we might be saved. I'd like to look in the 10th chapter of Hebrews. In verse 4 it says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Now, someone tried to calculate historically, and some of you are given to math, and some of you are quite good at math. You might be able to uh, do a little calculations for me. They tried to estimate how much blood had been spilt historically through uh, the uh, sacrificial system of the Jewish people. I mean, talking, we're talking about all the animals that have been sacrificed. So they, the little study that was done, they calculated how much blood a bull might have that would be offered or how much blood a goat might have or a lamb might have. And, and, but, you know, instead of me trying to uh, estimate how many gallons of blood historically have been, had been shed through the sacrificial system under the old covenant, just understand there's been a sea of blood that has been shed. And notice it says, for it is not possible. Say it is not possible. It's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. You say, well, what was the reason? Why did God, dis- why did God demand it? Why did God prescribe it? Why did they do it? Well, they did it because they looked forward to that once and for all sacrifice. It all pointed to the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. That's in Hebrews 10, 4 and verse 12 it says, but this man, that's Jesus, this man, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice, say one sacrifice, there were thousands, some estimate millions of sacrifices historically, but this one sacrifice stands out above all other sacrifices. This man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, say forever, he sat down on the right hand of God. It was finished, a once and for all sacrifice. Verse 14 says, For by one offering, say one offering, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. 
a once and for all, never to be repeated sacrifice. There's no repeat sacrifices needed. And as I looked at that Hebrews 9, 22 scripture, without the shedding of blood is no remission, I purposed as a minister of Jesus Christ to preach more about the blood of Jesus than I ever have before. And it's not like that I've been bloodless in my preaching. I preach a lot about the blood of Jesus Christ. But if you hang around here and you let me hang around here, we're going to be talking more and more about the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, when Billy Graham started his ministry, he was impressive. But there was, uh, there was one, uh, I believe he was a professor that gave him some advice and he said, you're going to be well received. You're, you're going to, you're, your ministry is going to explode. But let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. You need to leave off the blood of Jesus. It's offensive. Uh, it's offensive to people. People don't want to hear it. And if you'll just leave the blood of Jesus off, that was the counsel he received as a young preacher. Well, you can imagine what that did to the Holy Spirit on the inside of him. And with great resolve, he made the decision never to diminish the preaching of the blood of Jesus Christ. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. If you're uh, under the sound of my voice, either by the video or here today, and you're not saved, I don't want you to miss heaven. But you know God doesn't want you to miss heaven. And that means even more. God doesn't want you to be, miss heaven and He doesn't want you to end up in hell. And that's a forever and ever deal. And you don't want to end up there. You've got to know that sal whatever you've been told, whatever you've been told, whatever you've bought into, understand what the Word of God says. Truth be told, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin. Salvation comes only by the blood of the Lamb. And you won't make heaven unless you're blood washed. In Ephesians 1, 7, the apostle said, In whom, that's in Jesus, we have redemption. Say redemption. redemption. Through His blood. Say through His blood. Redemption. redemption is through His blood. And there's a comma. And then it says the forgiveness of sins. As if he equates redemption with the forgiveness of sins. Redemption means purchased with a price. And then we know from Peter's writing that that price was the precious blood of Jesus. We have the forgiveness of sin. It says according to the riches of His grace. Well, the riches of His grace sounds phenomenal, doesn't it? And it comes to us through the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is the riches of His grace. In Colossians 1.14 it says, In whom we have redemption through His blood. It's almost a repeat. In whom we have, we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. In Romans 5, 9, it says much more than being justified, being now justified by His blood. Say justified. justified. Justified by His blood. We shall be saved. Say we shall be saved. From wrath through Him. The only way to be saved from wrath is through the blood of Jesus Christ. There's only one way to avoid the wrath of God. And it is through the blood of Jesus Christ. In Revelation 5, 9, it says, And they sang a new song. I was tempted to go back through and count all my scriptures I'm going to throw at you today. And then I said, nope, not going to do it. <laughs> I'm be ashamed of myself. No, I'm not going to be ashamed for giving you the word of God. Revelation 5, 9, it says, Then they sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open its seals. For Thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God, by thy blood, say by thy blood, by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, the gospel of Jesus Christ goes to the ends of the earth and salvation is available to any and all who would believe. Thank God for the redeeming blood of Jesus Christ. Will you thank him for his redeeming blood? Hallelujah. Thank him for his redeeming blood. 
we flip a page and I'll take you to that 1 Peter 1, uh, 18 and 19 scripture. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. For as much as, as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from your vain conversation or manner of life received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood. We're redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He was the perfect lamb of God and he was slain. The prophet Isaiah said he was wounded for our transgressions. His blood is connected to our redemption. We are purchased. That's purchasing blood. We can call it redeeming blood. You can call it purchasing blood. But His blood bought us back to God. God purchased us and bought us back to Himself, as it were. He paid for us. And then I'd like for you to thank God for His cleansing blood based, based on 1 John 1, 7. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. It's redeeming blood or purchasing blood and it's cleansing blood. How many of you are glad to be clean? We are made clean from our sin. There's only one way for you to gain uh, purity in the eyes of God and it's through the blood of Jesus Christ. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. In Revelation chapter 1, in verse 5, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. There's only one way to be washed from your sins, and it's through the blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Thank God for the forgiving blood of Jesus Christ. It's a redeeming blood or purchasing blood it's a cleansing blood. It's a forgiving blood. It's a justifying blood. Romans 5, 9, it tells us that we are justified through His blood. We're set right with God. It's a legal term. How many of you are glad to be set right with God? Judicially, God says you're right with Him because it's, someone said it's just as if we never sinned uh, because the blood of Jesus Christ has washed away our sin completely removed it from our lives as far as the east is from the west. Justifying blood, we're set right with God. It happens the moment you trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And then I'd like for you to thank God uh, for the peace that comes through the blood of His cross. It's a peace-making blood, that blood of Jesus. Let's look in Colossians chapter 1, and uh, it's verse 20, and we'll just look at the last part of the verse. Colossians 1 and verse 20, it says, uh, and, well, we'll look at the first part. And having made peace through the blood of His cross. And having made peace through the blood of His cross. How are we at peace with God? Only through the blood of of Jesus Christ and having made peace through the blood of His cross. And then I've never talked to anyone about their salvation experience. I don't think. I always try to tell people about Romans 5. If I'm leading someone to the Lord, I want to give them this. Because uh, once they accepted Christ, they need to see what the Word of God says. In Romans 5.1 it says, Therefore being justified by faith, now in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Faith accesses God's gift, or lay hold, lays hold of God's gift. By grace, it's by grace. Therefore being justified by faith, it says, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you want to have peace with God? Well, the peace that we have with God is based on the blood of Jesus Christ. Look down in verse 9 and compare 1 with 9. It says, much more than being now justified by, in verse 1 it says faith, but what does it say here? It says by His blood. Let's just put it together. 
It doesn't cancel. They're not contradictory terms. It's faith in His blood. It's faith in the finished work of Christ where He shed His blood. Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. We're saved because of the blood of Jesus Christ. We are set at peace with God through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's a peace-making blood. That's a peace-giving blood. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank God for access into the Holy of Holies. And you say, what, what, Jeff, what does that mean? Well, you don't, have to, you don't have to depend on someone else to go into the presence of God for you. Once you're saved, God allows you to have access to His throne. Which means that you can have an audience with your Creator. It means that you can talk to God. How many of you are grateful for the gift of prayer? And in the book of Hebrews, again... It, it teaches us this great truth. I want to go back to the 10th chapter. And uh, I want to look down, I think, to verse 19. It says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest. And that's the holy of holies. You know, the, the, the type that was on earth when Jesus died, you remember the holy of holies was separated by a great veil. And what happened when, when Jesus died that veil was rent. It was torn from top to bottom so everyone would know it was an act of God. It was, it was not done by man. It was torn and opened up access into the Holy of Holies. That's a figurative, uh, figurative thing to show us that now we don't have to depend on a priest to go in to that most holy place once a year on the Day of Atonement, but now we can boldly enter into His presence. We have been given access. It says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. How can we enter into His presence? Well, we do so because He's paved the way with His precious blood. It's by the blood of Jesus Christ that we have boldness to enter. Entrance, blood that allows us entrance into the Holy of Holies. And I'd like for you to think about nearness. Ephesians, Ephesians 2 and uh, verse 13. It says this. It says, but now in Christ Jesus... You who are one times or once were far off, say far off, are made nigh or made near. And how are we made near? By the blood of Christ. We're made near by the blood of Christ. You probably remember that old hymn. Maybe you don't, but maybe you do. But there, there is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God. You draw me nearer, nearer, nearer to thy precious bleeding side. There's a, there's, God, God has made it possible for you to have intimacy, a closeness, a nearness to the Lord. We have been made, we were once far off. We were once on the outside looking in. But He not only brought us in, He's brought us near, brought us close to Himself. And there's something really special about being near to the heart of God I'm exploring that a little bit in my study. I'm thinking quite a bit about it. I thought about giving it to you as an assignment. Just what does that mean? I remember once the Holy Spirit whispered to me uh, the, the benefits of nearness. And, and one of the things he said was when you're near, you can hear. And it means more to me now than ever. <laughs> because when you're near, you can hear. And sometimes i got to lean in to try to hear people uh, and really focus to try to get it. But I'm telling you, God, sometimes he just whispers and we need to have an ear to hear what he would say. How many want to hear what God has to say? There's something about nearness. God wants to bring you near. We were at one time apart from Him, way apart, cut off from the commonwealth of Israel, not part of the covenant, but He's brought us near, brought us near, close to Himself, near, nearness, and it's only because of the blood of Jesus Christ. 
Maybe one of the greatest truths, and I'm not so sure if this isn't the last reference to the blood of Jesus in your New Testament. You'll have to check me out on that. Fact check me if you want to and let me know if I'm wrong. But uh, in Revelation 12, 11, it says, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. Say the blood of the Lamb. You say, well, why is, it, why is that? What's the big deal about that verse? Well, it's, when it says they overcame him, you need to know who him is. And who is the him? Well, you have to back up. And if you just back up and look in verse 7, it says that there was a war in heaven and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought against his angels. And you say, Jeff, that really in the Bible? Dragons and fighting and that kind of stuff? And, and it says it right there in verse 7. And then it says, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in the heaven and look at verse 9, it's very explanatory on who we deal with in the earth. It says, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent who, you know, surfaced quickly in our Bibles in the book of Genesis. That old serpent, the devil, called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down who accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame Him by the blood of the... How many of you want to overcome the devil? You want to overcome his deception? His accusation? His temptation? If you want to live the overcoming life, what's going to be the secret? The blood of Jesus Christ. It says, and they overcame Him by the blood of the Lamb. It's an overcoming blood, isn't it? There's overcoming power in the blood of the Lamb. There's power in the blood of Jesus. Wonder-working power in the blood of Jesus. And then if you can stand to take a couple of more, I want to give you one out of Hebrews chapter 13 and I won't spend a lot of time on it, but I want to give it to you because I think it's important for every believer. In uh, Hebrews 13, it says, Wherefore, Jesus also, that He might sanctify the people with His own blood, suffered without the gate or without outside. He's outside the, outside the city. That's where He suffered. That He might sanctify us through His blood, Sanctifying has to do with God setting you apart for His purposes. And I believe that your life as a saved individual is set apart for the high purposes of God, the eternal purposes of God. And I believe that's an ongoing process. As you yield to the Holy Spirit, He will use your life as an instrument of His grace in the earth. How many of you want to be used of God in ministry to touch other people's lives? Well, we can't be silent concerning the blood truth of the gospel. I've already given you enough reasons. There's a lot of reasons for us not to be silent. Thank God for the precious blood of Jesus. I hope that we would never seek to diminish the great importance of the blood of Jesus. Let's not, not stop preaching about it. Let's definitely not stop singing about it. Let's make sure that it's, it's part of the doctrine that we believe. You, you know, if someone said, you cut the Bible anyway, it'll bleed. <laughs> Anywhere you want, from Genesis to the book of Revelation, there's a scarlet thread that runs throughout the Scriptures. The blood of Jesus Christ is important. Couldn't be more important. But you know what's happening, don't you? There are those that scorn and despise the blood of Jesus Christ. And again, and uh, make sure you tell... There he is right there. Did, did you already hear me talking about you? Or did you come in after I was talking about you? I'm blaming all this on you today. <laughs> you already been known? Okay. Uh, John Bradley asked me a question. I got to study in the book of Hebrews. This is what come out of it. Somebody else sitting back there on the back row asked me a question. I still haven't got done preaching about it on Wednesday nights. But uh, Hebrews 10, 29, it took me from February till now on Wednesday nights. I'm still talking about it. Answered, tried to answer a question. Took me three months to answer a question. <laughs> Hebrews 10, 29 says, Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden, now get the picture of this, trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant with which he has, was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit 
of grace. That's a frightening scripture. That's a frightening scripture that someone could scorn and despise the blood of Jesus Christ. I prefer you leave here under the blood and not the blood under your feet. I prefer you be under the blood than trample underfoot the Son of God and His precious blood. Make sure the blood is where it's supposed to be. Make sure it's applied to your heart. Make sure you have respect and reverence for the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood is so crucial to all that we believe. I've talked to you about it being redeeming and justifying and forgiving and all those words, sanctifying. There's a whole list of them, weren't there? Peacemaking. The blood is crucial to all we believe. Very foundational to all that we believe. I believe it's really the bedrock of our faith. Without the blood of Jesus Christ, we don't have a gospel. And I refuse to be silent. And I will not shrink back. And I will proclaim the blood truth of the Bible until I die and take my last breath. Some days you wonder if that's close, but I'm going to try to be faithful to proclaim the blood of Jesus Christ to the very end. You can go with what you think you have to, but as for me, I'm holding on to the blood of Jesus Christ. I will cling to the blood of Jesus Christ and I will proclaim the power that's in His precious blood to save from sin. And that was the testimony that I heard on Wednesday night. It was the blood of Jesus through song and through, uh, and, and through the testimony. The blood of Jesus Christ redeems us. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Listen, where will you spend eternity? Will you spend eternity with God in heaven? Or will you be separated from God forever and ever? And it comes down, it comes down to this. It comes down to the blood of Jesus Christ. One of my favorite stories, and I, I do repeat it, but I, I, it still stirs me every time I read it. Almost brings me to tears when I read it by myself. John Wesley, who was, he, he was on horseback after the meeting. John Wesley was, must have been an amazing, amazing preacher in yesteryear. But he was returning from a service. It was after a service, after a night service. I don't know how late in the night, but he was held up. He was robbed. He only had a few coins. He invited the robber, the thief, to investigate his saddlebags, which he did, only to find Bibles and literature and books. No more money. Uh, he was disappointed. Just a few coins from this preacher. And he began to leave. And Wesley, instead of being grateful for him leaving, called out to him. Can you believe it? He said, stop. He said, stop. I, I, I have something more to give you. I only got a few coins. The guy turned and he said, someday you may regret this sort of life that you're living. Someday you may regret the kind of life you're living. And if you ever do, there's something I want you to remember. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin. The thief hurried away. And Wesley prayed that his words might bear fruit. And it was years later, and you can't really find out how many years later. Almost all of it says, the stories are, years later. Wesley was greeting people after a Sunday service, and a stranger approached him. And it was the thief from years ago that had robbed him of those few coins. And now he was a successful businessman. The man said, I owe it all to you. And Wesley protested, Oh no, my friend. Not to me, but to the precious blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses from all sin. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. For the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. 
large religious service being conducted in the Golden Gate ex- ex- Exposition in San Francisco years ago, and many people were quickly becoming aware that the minister delivering the main address was not thoroughly orthodox. He was a gifted speaker, and he began to direct most of his eloquence against the power of the blood of Christ. Can you imagine that? Speaking against the blood of Christ. And uh, when his fluent oratory ended, a timid elderly lady stood up in the midst of the crowd and softly began to sing the great hymn by William Cowper, as a touching rebuttal to the modernist remarks. And a hush fell over the assembly as they heard those faint but familiar words. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Before she could begin the second stanza, approximately a hundred people rose to join her. By the time she reached the third verse, nearly a thousand Christians all over the audience were singing that blessed song of faith. The triumphant, thrilling strains ring out loud and clear. Dear dying Lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power till all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more. Many were deeply moved as that humble believer stood up for her Lord and with the light of heaven upon her face gave testimony that she had found peace through the blood of His cross. We live in a sad sad hour, that's for sure. An hour in which many, both within and without the church, see no need for old-fashioned, Bible-centered, blood-bought salvation. They say things like, man doesn't need the blood in order to be saved. That's not true. That's a lie. The truth needs to be told. We live in a time when many mainline denominations have moved away from proclaiming uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ and more of something else. But it's not the gospel of the blood of Jesus Christ. Some have actually removed the blood from their hymnals. What a sad thing. One female theologian by the name of Dolores Williams is alleged to have said, I don't think we need a theory of atonement at all. Well, I want you to know what I believe in the way of atonement is no theory. It is the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. She said, I don't think we need folks hanging on crosses and blood dripping and weird stuff. It's not weird stuff. It's God ordained. God demanded a sacrifice and His Son provided it. And because of that sacrifice, we can be saved. I hope it matters to you today. What matters is not what a lot of people are saying. And we've got all these voices trying to talk to us horizontally in the earth. You need to hear, thus saith the Lord. You need to hear what God is saying. What matters most is what God has said. Just as a a body emptied of blood becomes a corpse and dies, so faith devoid of the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ is also dead. Yeah, the blood is the bedrock of our faith and practice. The church, the Bible, the gospel, and our faith, apart from the blood, it's all dead doesn't mean anything. There's no life in it. But thank God for the blood. Thank Him for the blood today. And the blood of Jesus Christ will never, never lose its power. In uh, 1876, there was a man by the name of Robert Lowry. Um, If I wanted to, I could tell you a little bit more about him. But just to tell you today... He wrote this amazing hymn, and it became popular. I mean, it became at the top in all the hymnals that were produced everywhere. This song became important to the church. I think this song ought to be important to you. It was written in 1876, and it has truth, because truth transcends time. It it doesn't get outdated. This truth doesn't. What can wash away my sin, he wrote? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. 
What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. He said and wrote, For my pardon, this I see. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing, this my plea. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Now by this I'll overcome nothing but the blood of Jesus. And now by this I'll reach my home, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This gets left out in some of the hymnals, but he wrote it with the hymn. And then the last stanza, glory, glory, this I sing, nothing but the blood of Jesus. All my praise for this I bring, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Let your praise ring out in the church of today, in the house of God, for the blood of Jesus Christ. Would you get on your feet and give Him praise? For His precious blood. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank You for Your blood. We thank You for Your blood that redeems us. We thank You for Your blood that, that cleanses us, brings forgiveness to our life, sanctifies us, gives us access into the holy place, brings us near Thank You, Lord, for the blood that does all of those amazing things that Your Word clearly teaches. Thank You for saving us from the wrath to come through the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank You, Lord, for making us Yours through Your precious blood. I glorify Your name today, Lord. If there's anyone outside the covenant, if there's anyone that's never believed in the power of the blood covenant of Jesus Christ, we pray today they'll place their trust in Him, in His finished work, in the sacrifice that He made on the cross where His blood was poured out for us. We give You praise. We give You glory. I pray anyone that's lost today will be saved and come to Christ. Have the promise of heaven. Escape the awfulness and horrors of hell. In Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. 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 We're going to sing if you need to respond in any way.